Amen. If you would, high five somebody on your way to your seat and say, it's good to see you. Is that good to see you? Good to see you guys. Hey, I am not Pastor Tracy. Um, he, he was supposed to be um, uh, preaching today. Uh, if you've been with us for a few weeks, I had three weeks of a sermon series that we did, and we talked about discipleship. And then Friday afternoon, uh, he started feeling not so good, and, uh, and the text was sent out like, hey, maybe be prepared. You know, so my radar's up now, okay? It's Friday afternoon, and I was out in the yard working a chainsaw and almost died, but that's beside the point. That chain, the chain came off the chainsaw and, and grabbed me right, it, uh, hit my leg, but I squat, okay? <laughs> God's hand was definitely on me uh, that afternoon, um, uh, but yeah, so how many of y'all know God's still breaking chains? Come on, somebody, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the men in the room were like, that's why you don't wear skinny jeans, Josh. Like, you don't need to operate a chainsaw. <laughs> so if you need any yard work done, just uh, see me after and I'll... Uh... No, but uh, so I get the, the message like, hey, you might need to be prepared uh, just in case. And so uh, the confidence level in having to prepare one a, a little high, you know, and then um, Saturday morning, yesterday, uh, I, was, I realized like, oh, this is for real, for real. Okay. <laughs> this is all hands on deck. So a uh, little notice, and usually um, uh, Glenn asked me, and PT even mentioned, are you just going to pull up a, an old sermon that you've preached before? And um, I would, if I could like Google, like how it's organized in my Google Drive, um, not too conducive to like, all right, pull this up by date. For some things. But usually, because um, Wednesdays as a youth pastor also, um, I would have one prepared and brewing for Wednesday. But this month, we're talking about love, sex, and dating <laughs> at youth, and we're doing it different this year. So we've actually been sitting down and interviewing each other. Uh, I interview Mark and vice versa, and, and Amber and Marissa interview each other. And I didn't think you wanted all that. I didn't think you wanted us to be up here talking about love, sex, and dating. Um, but Wednesday, we do want to see your teenagers, uh, 6th to 12th grade right here, and we're going to talk about love, sex, and dating. Um, but uh, this is a fresh word, and I told them this morning, it's so fresh that it may need to be in the oven a little bit longer, uh, <laughs> is the way we're looking at it. Uh, but I wanted to talk from uh, this story that uh, it kind of just resonated with me because through our last series, some people would come up and say, uh, man, I'm, I'm trying to think now about who I should be discipling, who I should invite behind the scenes and, and like invite along this process to disciple them uh, and, uh, and my next step. And then others are like, hey, I feel like I'm having this impress upon me that I need to do this big step. I need to like follow this calling and I want to know what my next step might be. So that's been like coming up uh, with various conversations I've been having. And I thought, well, let's do a message on, on confidence. How can you have confidence in your calling? How can I walk in confidence in trying to serve God? So if you would look to the person that you didn't say good morning to already and share today's sermon title uh, in your best rock voice and say, walk this way. If you, yeah. Burst a blood vessel, you know. Talk this way. Yeah, you do, you know, you won't forget that one. But walk this way. We, we are, if you're a Christian, if, you're, if you've given your life to Christ, then it's, you should be walking with confidence, you know, uh, a sense of like a uh, purpose in, in, your, in each step. But how many of you know that sometimes life happens? Sometimes a chain will come off of a chainsaw and change the project, <laughs> your plans for the afternoon, you know? So like th- sometimes there's a step back. So how do I, how do I rebound my confidence? And, and I want to not just talk about like getting your confidence back. I actually want to talk about where was it placed to begin with. Maybe it's been in the wrong place this whole, this whole time, and that's the issue. So the person that comes to my mind when I think about um, confidence, because I could have just done like a part four behind the scenes. Because how many of y'all know that Peter went fishing again after the resurrection, and his nets almost began to burst again, right? I, we could have done that. We could have made up some, some stuff there. But then I got to thinking about how we last week talked about this mountain experience where Jesus was there with Moses and Elijah. And I thought, well, hey, let's let's talk about Moses's experience, because Moses had a couple of mountaintop experiences. And one of them, his confidence was shot, like his confidence was was low. 
And it revolved around him having an identity crisis. And so I want us to talk uh, from that, uh, that standpoint. So if you brought a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 3. And I'm going to kind of hop around and skip around here a, a little bit. Um, as you kind of turn there, I'm going to do a little, little delay thing, tell you a story. You, you good for a story? I want to tell you about a time. Um, I want to ask this question to set it up. Think of a time when you felt the most confident. Don't, don't say it. Don't say it because you don't want your spouse to say, that was it? That was it wasn't all that, honey, you know, but like the most confident, the, the most confident for me, some of my first memories would be uh, on the baseball field, you know, um, after my dad, uh, and I was, I must have been like T-ball when I realized the, the need for defense. Uh, how many of you know, like at T-ball, we just all chase the ball. And if it gets by you, that's okay. We're going to jump on the ground like, like it's a, a fumbled football or something. But my dad took me out in the yard and he started hitting ground balls. I mean, if it got by me, that's when he taught me that when it gets by you, your team is now hurting because that person's going to score. So then I understand the concept of, well, my team's counting on me. And from that moment forward, defense became my thing. So it was my responsibility between first and second base. If it was hit in that direction, I didn't care if it was 20 feet in the air. I felt responsible for getting that ball, and I felt so good whenever someone would just hit a shot up the middle thinking, I got me a single today, and I had to disappoint them in front of their mom and their grandma and their auntie and everybody and send them back to the dugout and say, not today. <laughs> I, felt, I felt pretty, you know, felt pretty good about that. I've still got marks all on my butt, my knees, my elbows, where I, I just sacrificed for the team, you know, for the, the team. But the, the most confident, the most confident, I would have to say, actually happened in this room. Didn't have anything to do with preaching. It was um, a Christmas Eve when I lied to Marissa and told her that I left my mom's Christmas gift at the church, and I needed her to let me back in the building after Christmas Eve service, and I proposed to her right here. Uh, and it was back when, these stair, when there were stairs, and, and they were covered in red velvet, or what, what was that? Carpet, carpet just red carpet. <laughs> In my mind, everything was lit up and, you know, <laughs> trimmed in gold. And then 18 months later, I, I walked down this aisle, uh, and, and some of y'all were there, and we had this stage uh, filled with uh, sunflowers, yeah, fake sunflowers, but sunflowers. Uh, and, and, and I walked down, and I didn't realize how different this was until now I'm, I'm helping do weddings. And, um, and when, when we had our wedding, Marissa walked down to Need to Breathe, Washed by the water. Now, that, that's a good song. That it was a preacher. She was his wife. Yeah, I can't sing like that. But, <laughs> but, um, but she walked down to that. But before she walked down, I didn't realize how different this was. I walked down. I had me a moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so she walked down to something that was like pretty religious and, you know, need to breathe. That's pretty cool. You can, you can really, you, like if you played that in church, uh, you know, even church people wouldn't be like, oh, okay, like, no, for me. They'd be like, okay, I get that. But me, I walked down uh, to um, I'm the Man and by Aloe Black. I'm the man, I'm the man. Yeah, I w that's what I was. Yeah. That's, that's what I walked down to. But, but get, I was in my tuxedo and my, my custom Converse, uh, Carolina blue and yellow. That was our wedding colors. And I believe on the heel, I should have worn them today. I think it said, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was, I was feeling good. I was, I was, I was feeling good. So I walked down, but uh, I walked down the aisle and I wanted to play the video, but I just found out I was preaching Friday afternoon and then really confirmed yesterday morning. So I didn't have time to pull the video, but I walked down <laughs> in slow motion. I was walking in slow motion. Everyone else was living in real time. And I had on sunshades. And I got right here, and so there's a picture of my uncle looking up at me as I'm walking by, and he's like, what is happening here? Yeah. And I get here, and I do a jump stop and pivot around, face the crowd, take off my sunshades, fold them up, put them in my pocket, and handle business at the altar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? That was, I was confident, boy. You couldn't. But I was confident because I had some, some clothes on. My hair got cut that day right? Uh, but I was also confident because I knew where I was going. I, I knew what I was supposed to say when I got there. It was very simple. And if I forgot, it was on the back of my shoes. I do. <laughs> so like I, I knew I was very confident in all this, but I was very confident because 
the person I was coming to meet here had already given me their yes. Marissa had already said yes 18 months prior. So I'm wondering why is it that as Christ followers, if that is you, that we could have this calling that God has placed upon us, but yet still we go with hesitation and a lack of confidence when he's already given you his yes. Right? So I, I, I stagger and I, and I, and I delay my, my purpose and my promise through this process because I just, I, just, I just don't know, not about God, but about me. And my confidence now is inhibiting my calling. And, and that's gonna, that causes pause where I need to now readjust and reassess some things, okay? So when it comes to those big confident moments, it could be this, that confidence in the wrong place will exhaust you to please people who aren't even paying attention to you. I'm trying to go into overdrive. First service didn't get that, y'all, okay? Because my notes are all over the place. I got post-its uh, and just, because uh, usually, two days, okay, a day and a quarter, okay? <laughs> and I wanted to, like, find it down to, to get here, but, but we can just be on overdrive to please people who aren't even paying attention. And if they are paying attention, it's not for long. Right. right. It's, it's I, I'm, and my confidence is taking a hit, yeah. but, but get this part, too, that where my confidence is placed determines when it runs out. If, if it's placed in certain places, it's going to inhibit how long I have it. Sometimes our confidence gets robbed because of where we place it or who we place it in or what we place it in. So, so get this. Here's some examples for you for real world experiences. Um, if your confidence is in your intellect and you've got the degree and the, and the master's and the doctorate, if, you, if your confidence is in your intellect and how much you know, then get this, your audience controls your confidence. Because when, you're, when you're, in, you're the boss and you're in your meeting, you can feel confident. But now I need you to go to the board meeting with all the other MBAs and PhDs, and, and now I want you to have the same kind of swag. Right. Uh, I, I need you to walk into a, a graduating class reunion where you're starting to see the. Well, I know that he owns two businesses and that Fortune 500. And I saw the car that she drives on the way. And all of a sudden, my confidence starts to give because it was placed in the wrong place. Right. Uh, if, if maybe it's not intellect for you, maybe it's your body image. If your confidence is in your body image, then time controls your confidence. Come on, somebody. Hey, at some point, time wins. Time is undefeated. I tell Marissa, hey, we get an old girl. We make noises sitting down and getting up. You know, hey, it, it happens. It comes for us all. But if it's in my image, if, if it's all about me trying to get the likes on my Instagram posts and like, please, dear God, please let spring hurry up and come because I've got a new bathing suit and I want to get all the, it's like, hang on now. What is the purpose? Right, my confidence is all of a sudden in this other thing, this body image, and and it's going to dwindle. Uh, maybe if it's uh, your job, maybe for like our soldiers, maybe your confidence is being a soldier, and that is great. Be proud of that. But at some point, the the uniform comes off, Amen. and my confidence has been placed in this my entire career. Yeah. Or maybe your your confidence is in your relationship, mm -hmm. and now, boo boo, you you've given your boyfriend mm -hmm. control of your confidence. Yeah. So when the relationship is shaky, all of a sudden you're wondering, like, who am I and, and am I good enough? And now all these questions start coming in, all because your confidence was placed in the wrong place. Y'all yeah. want another one? Yeah. If your confidence is in your bank account, uh -huh. ugh, okay, your, your savings account, your 401k, you understand? Yeah. You still trying to find out who Roth is, okay? <laughs> All of a sudden, it, 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 can, it can impact and it has control of your confidence yes. because you see that economy dip yes. and with it goes your confidence. Yes. And now because my bank account is low, my confidence is low, and now I'm coming home a different kind of person yes. because of where my confidence was placed at, Right? So, so now let's gather around this, this thought now that we have this tension and that we all can agree that we're in the, the same kind of situation. And let's establish this today. If your confidence is in God, then you will be strong and courageous. How many times did he tell Joshua that? Like, hey, be strong and courageous. He was saying that because he knew he, you're going to need to be these things. 
it wasn't necessarily that Josh already had these things, but Josh came after Moses. Moses did some stuff. So I, I want to look at Moses' story. Uh, how many of y'all know Moses had a, a crazy story? Moses' story, man, if I was a youth pastor on a Wednesday, I'd say, bruh. <laughs> Moses' story will have you feeling confident if you just read it for as it is. But Mo- Moses' story, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. So that's a pretty cool perspective to have in itself. But now get this. He, as a child, when he was born, the Pharaoh of Egypt said, hey, let's have a new rule because there are too many Hebrews being born. And they're outnumbering us. If you're like, I don't understand why you would do that. Think a bug's life, the grasshoppers versus the ants, <laughs> right? And how they thought as long as we enslave them and make them work for us and they never know that they outnumber us, then we will be good to go. That's what was happening in real life. So in this moment, um, the, the Pharaoh says, hey, if a Hebrew boy is born, kill it. Throw it in the Nile, right? And, and this one mom She had a Hebrew boy and just couldn't bring herself to do it. So she put him in the Nile, but she put him in a basket. And she placed herself to where she would put it out in the water, and it went by the palace. And then Pharaoh's daughter's out there and said, well, that's a cute little baby boy. I I, I, want to keep it like it's a puppy. You know, like, uh, honey, it doesn't really work that way. Maybe let's go find the parents, you know. But but she says, I want to keep it. And so she needed, uh, she had the midwives uh, take care of it. And guess which midwife she happened to choose? The actual mom. That's pretty cool. Cool how God works that way. So now, get this. This baby was born Hebrew, purposed to be Hebrew, which is an Israelite, but grows up Egyptian. Grows up with an Egyptian education. Grows up in the palace. Real quick, raise your hand if you've grown up in a palace. I'd really love to talk to you about our building fund. (laughs) That we've got? No? Okay. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, so he grew up in this palace. So he was, he was not out there working hard. He was inside hardly working. Uh, his people, his, his Hebrew family was outside serving those inside the palace being served. So what we're going to find out is in this story of Moses' upbringing in his life is he was too Egyptian to actually be Hebrew. But he was too Hebrew to really be Egyptian. He begins with an identity crisis. He begins with his confidence being waning and wondering, who am I exactly? And that brings us to the picture you see behind us. Aren't you thankful for this frizzle school bus that we have? This is where the story that we're about to look at actually happened. So what would go on to happen is that Moses... Bless the Lord, Moses. He would grow up, and one day he looks out, and he's kind of had enough that he sees an Egyptian slave driver beating a Hebrew. And he says, I can't go for this. So he goes out, and he kills the Egyptian. Like Now, we don't condone that kind of violence, but, (laughs) but it is in the Bible. So I'm just reporting what the Bible says. He kills him, and then the next day he sees two Hebrew guys arguing. And he jumps in there and says, hey, guys, let's cut this out. We're both Hebrew. or both. We're all Hebrew. And they're like, um, uh, we are, you know. Uh, but who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you going to kill us like you did the, the guy yesterday? And he's like, oh, y'all had seen that. Okay. <laughs> y'all had, okay. Okay. Um, so then he runs and he flees. And he goes three days journey away into the wilderness. Now, get this. He grew up in the palace. He knows nothing about the wilderness. All right. It's like he was out in his front yard with a chainsaw trying to (laughs) don't know nothing about these streets. So he is out in this desert. And then when he's there, he has these, he meets these, um, these daughters who are there and they're just trying to get some water for their flock, for their dad, who was the priest in the area. And they're getting attacked by these other guys who know we're going to have um, this water. And they're trying to kind of push them and beat them around and that kind of stuff. And so Moses comes to their rescue. And he says, hey, let's not do this. And then he takes care of them. And he actually takes care of the flock. They go back and tell their dad. And their dad's like, oh, well, invite him in. Where, where is he? Like, he helped us. We should bless him. He gives him one of his daughters. So guys, if you ever see something, you should probably do something. Because then you might get married out of it. Just saying. But that's what happens, okay? I'm just trying to fast forward you to where we're going to pick up here in a second scripture. 
So he then becomes a shepherd for this guy, his father-in-law. And get this, shepherds were despised by Egyptians. He grew up an Egyptian and now has become something they despised, that they thought was an abomination. And now he's been doing this for 40 years. And then we pick up when God shows up on the scene in chapter 3, verse 9. Here's what it says. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. Uh, Pause, God, uh, real quick. Uh, You said that the Egyptians were crying. I'm good. I'm over, you know, I'm enjoying, you know, my little shepherd uh, deal, my my retirement plan. Because now Moses is like 80 years old, right? He's trying to just wind it on down. But uh, they were crying, uh, God, so you probably want to go see about that. Um, But it's not like you said for me to go do something. I I just think that you should be the one that that takes that on. And God said, I am. (laughs) I'm doing something about it through you. I I want to use you to do it. Uh, He goes on, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And now we get into this conversation where we see Moses give five objections on why he should not be qualified to do this job. Objection number one, it comes in verse 11, uh, where he says, but Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? I don't even know who I am. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I to do that job? And that brings us to our first point, is that you need to trust who is with you. Because here's what I don't understand. Don't you love it when like, you ask a question to your spouse or your boss or something, and then they answer with something else, and you're like, um, that's not even what I asked. I didn't. I think you meant. Let me rephrase the question. Right? Because Moses said, who am I? And God said, here's where I'm going to be. <laughs> I was like, ah, those are not the same. But is it? Because he's saying... Who am I? And, and God essentially is saying, it doesn't quite matter who you think you are, but who I'm calling you to be. Here's all you need to know is that I'm going to be with you. If I called you, I'm with you. So you need to trust, to have confidence in your calling. You need to trust who is with you. If I had to rely on me and myself, it would be something to worry about and not have a bunch of confidence in. But when I know that God is with me because God has called me to this, I can have some confidence in that. Uh, So get this, if it comes to your identity, who you are stems from whose you are. Who you are going to be stems from whose you belong to or who it is that you belong to. In this case, God is who we belong to. So the area you are least confident in, is it because you haven't asked God to lead you in that area? So where you're the most fearful is because you haven't taken time to say, God, I'm only going to go there if you're there. Uh, let, me, let me get real with you. It, we just uh, celebrated uh, Valentine's Day or Singles Awareness Day. Is it that you can pray confidently, God, I only want to be in this relationship if you're in this relationship. And that way I can tell that if at some point, if I'm not growing closer with God in this, what I thought was my calling, then this must not have been that calling. Right. If if I'm getting further and further away from what God said not to do and what to do, if we're not honoring God in this relationship, then all of a sudden I'm getting the feeling that maybe God didn't put me. This won't the this won't the ship. I need to abandon ship. Okay. So so in that, a sign that God is in it. If you're wondering, like, is this the calling? Is this the path that God has for me? A sign that God is in it is that you stay close to Him throughout. And you worship him throughout. Josh, where's the scripture for that? Very good question. Verse 11, he goes on to say, or sorry, verse 12, uh, God says, I will be with you and this will be your son to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt. I love that, that God's using future tense. Hey, I'm asking you to do it now. So when you do it, you know, when you do it, here's your son that you're actually going to come back here. You will worship God on this mountain. That's your sign. So it should draw you closer to worship. If what you feel called to do is taking you further from God, not a calling. 
You might want to check where your confidence has been placed, where your trust has been placed, and maybe where your desires are that have you in that situation, okay? That was point number one, and we have five, and I need to wrap up because my alarm has already gone off. So point number two, here we go. (laughs) Point number two comes from chapter three, verse 13. So um, next verse, Moses then uh, responds to God's, like, information, his answer, and says this, his, his next objection. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, oh yeah? Well, what's his name? What you call him? What, how do you introduce himself, right? Then what shall I tell them? Which is a good question. Great question. And it reminds me that I need to do this. I need to trust what God has given me. Trust what, trust what God gave you. In this case, he's like, hey, I don't even know what to call you. So God gives him his name, right? Can I have it? Can I get it? Can I get your name? Can I get you, right? He gives him the name. And the name is I am what I am, yeah. right? And it sounds like Papa, like he borrowed it from Papa, but not, not the case, okay? Um, it, it also says, if you watch the Avengers, whenever they create vision, they're like, hey, and what do we call you? He's like, I am. I was like, oh, come on, somebody, right? They, you're going all the way back to the Bible right there. But what it is, is it's a tense. It also means I will be what I will be. And if you're like, that doesn't make any sense. You've probably used this before when you got into maybe a disagreement with somebody and you said something kind of out of pocket and then you followed it with, I said what I said, right? <laughs> Same kind of context there. Uh, and get this, so when Moses would go to tell the Israelites this, he would say, um, so what was his name? It would be, uh, he is. The name of God proves the existence of God. I'm in my calling to follow God because of the existence of God. I should be honoring him because of who he is. What I'm doing points back to the fact that he exists, that it is him. Otherwise, why would a guy 80 plus years old, three days away, and tried to run from Egypt, come mosey on back and into town like, hey, I'm here to see about some business. It's like the reason I'm here is because somebody has sent me. I'm just wondering how many homes there might be where there's somebody that needs to be sent, right? That there's someone, there's, there's a child that needs to know more about God. So I've got to walk into my home sent. There's somebody at work that's like, God, if you just give me a sign and have a conversation like I told you about last week, that you got to walk into that job saying, I feel sent. I, I have a sense of purpose here, but I don't need to cower away because I already have God's yes. And I've got to serve him right there. But then we get our Moses kind of mentality, and point number three happens, a point where all of a sudden, I just saw Marissa's note up here. (laughs) You'd be writing on my notes, girl. It says, I love you. You got this, wrist, heart. Find you a boo (laughs) that will disrupt a sermon to give a great sermon illustration. Were you called to do that? Were you competent in the writing? (laughs) But in uh, Exodus chapter 4, Jesus, uh, God has just went on and like said a whole bunch of stuff, including this. He says, the elders of Israel will listen to you and get Moses' next objection in verse 1. This is, you can't make this up. Moses answered, what if they, which is a great start to a, my confidence is lacking, whenever you ask that question. But he says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? To which if I'm, if I, this is why I'm not God. If I was God, I'd be like, what did I just say? You know what I mean? <laughs> Boy, get, get, get down the mountain and come back up the mountain. Like, I'm going I'm to start having you do some stuff. Like, I, I already answered that question, but God is much better than me. But uh, check this out. He's 80 years old, and he's realizing that if I go back to Egypt, I'm probably going to have to talk to the, you're saying the leaders, the, the Hebrew leaders, and, and God, they're probably the same age as me. God, they probably remember me. They, they, they know who I was back then. They, they know what I did. They, they have a fond, well, not a fond, but a very vivid memory of what I've done that I've been trying to run away from. I've, I, I was trying to get away from it. Now you want me to go back and talk to them? So here's what we need to hang on to. We need to trust what God can do through you. Trust what God can do through you. Too many times we stop our calling because we're focused on what can I do? And we misquote Paul thinking that um, 
that God can do all things through me. And that's, that's not it. It's that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a reminder back to where I need to focus as I'm going through my calling. And though my next step is scary, I can have confidence. And that's where courage comes from. Courage is not the lack of fear. It's still taking the step despite the fear. So when we, when we consider that, Moses is asking this question, like, what if they kind of reject me? I, I don't have to go talk to them. So then God says, well, let me give you some signs. Uh, what's that in your hand? Because you already have what you need. And Moses at the time was holding a staff because he was a shepherd. And he says, throw it down. And so he throws it down and it becomes a snake. And he ran from it because he's smart. <laughs> because he's smart. And God says, all right, now the thing you were running from, I want you to pick it up. It was, it was like his past that he was running from. And now God's saying, I, I need you to go pick it up. I'm not done with that. So in this, he throws the staff down, becomes a snake, and he picks up by the tail, which some people say is the dangerous part to pick it up. But I watched Steve Irwin. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that end right there. I know they can come around and get you. That's why I just stay away from them all, you know. Well, where's my chainsaw, you know? Where's my <laughs> so if, if he's telling them to then pick it up, it, it becomes a staff again. He says, hey, that's one of the signs that you can show them to let them know that it, this is real. He said, if that doesn't work, put your hand in your pocket, pull it back out. It, it was leprous. It, it became diseased. And he put it back in there and put it back out and it was clean. And to which if I'm Moses, I'm thinking, I hope I don't have to pull that card. Right? You know, I, hope, I hope the snake thing does it. But he said, hey, if that doesn't, then get some water out of the Nile, pour it on the ground, it'll become blood, and then they'll know. But here's the thing. When Moses would eventually go and do these things and show these signs to Pharaoh, Pharaoh would turn around to his magicians and say, you show him. And they would replicate one of those signs. And it's just like today in modern time how God is trying to do some things, but then we'll settle for how the world can replicate and think that's the authentic thing. And now my confidence has been in the thing that's not authentic, but I called it that. It was misplaced the whole time. An example that uh, Marissa said that another person uh, gave as an example would be that moms, like if a mom puts her confidence in being a mom, then all of a sudden she looks at all these other moms killing it on Instagram. And now my, mom, my confidence as a mom is, is dwindling because of a, you, you mean to tell me that you cut all the crust off each sandwich? Right. <laughs> you, you invented a special lunchbox so they could heat up their their leftovers, and you cook the leftovers, and now your child has all A's and loves Jesus and already has a scholarship. It's like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, my confidence starts to wane on other people, and God's like, your confidence shouldn't have been in those people. I'm the one calling you. All right, and the praise team, y'all can come on up and come get me, because otherwise we're going to be here until next Sunday. Okay. So point number four. Point number four comes from verse 10. Here's what uh, Moses said to the Lord next. His next objection was, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. So now he, he's taking a hit to his like ability. And for me, I'm thinking that doesn't quite work out. Now, I didn't quite read this in a commentary, in this in depth. So this is just me thinking, is it possible so just kind of wonder with me, is it possible that he had an Egyptian education? So he, he was smart. And we don't have a record of him not being so eloquent during his Egyptian education. But it seems possible that when he tries to take his Egyptian education but then speak Hebrew to the Hebrews, that the translation and trying to now speak the language that he was brought up to speak, there's a delay and there's a stumble. And maybe even if I get the words right, my dialect and my tone is too Egyptian for them to receive it as Hebrew. And now I'm worried about how they'll even receive me because I don't seem too, too authentic. So I'm already wondering about my own abilities and capabilities. So my confidence declines. So if that's the case, if that's the case, then when it comes to struggling, up to this point, all of Moses' rejections have been a lack in confidence of in, in himself. So here's what we need to have confidence in, if that's you. 
trust his word, not their words. I can't put my confidence in other people who haven't even invested in me to begin with. They, they don't get to say, PT mentioned that a few weeks back or last year in our series. You, you don't get to say this because you haven't invested in me in, to begin with. So my confidence can't be in all these people and all these things. Don't get me wrong, like, I'm not what I do. Does that make sense? Like, whatever your job is, whatever your hobby is, that's just something you do. Whenever you identify yourself, you may say, hey, um, your name, and then maybe a job that you do. But now I've got to understand my calling is I'm a Christian named Josh who does whatever this thing is. My confidence begins with and ends with who God has called me and created me to be because there's a problem for me to solve. So I'm going to trust his word, not the words of everything floating around me. So how confident are you in God's word? And catch this as we start approaching point number five. Your level of obedience reflects your level of trust. You can say, oh yeah, I'm I'm all about God's word. I trust his word. Your level of obedience reflects your level of trust. So if I haven't been trusting it enough to actually do it, then my confidence is going to waver and get this, all the people I'm trying to testify to and show and disciple to are going to look at me and say, I don't even think you're confident enough to believe it yourself. But the level to which I obey and trust this is a testament unto itself so I can help show other people who God has called me to be. And although, yes, someone's hurt, I'm going to think, God, will you please help? Even though I've had a bad day, I'm going to think, God, could you do this in my life and in their life? I'm going to turn to God because I believe his word, I trust his word, and I have confidence in his word and who he is. But now we get to the last objection, and it's right here, verse number 13. After all this, God's response said, no, this, this, here's your response to that objection. Verse 13, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. God, I get it. You've you've given, you've answered all my objections. Please just send anybody else. I'm 80 years old. I don't want to do this anymore. Please send anyone else. He was unwilling. God will do what you're not able to do, but he will not do what you're unwilling to do. When it comes to having that willpower, get this. It's easy for us to say, I'm not going to do it because the struggle with misplacing your confidence is that it determines not just how you do something, but if you do something. So we need to, in those moments, trust that God wants to use you. And if you would, stand up on your feet, and I'm going to close this part. Help me close faster. We got to get out of here. You understand? I know. But I want you to linger in this moment because I want you to stand to, almost like to attention, to to answer the call. Because when it comes to, when it comes to your confidence and you trusting that God wants to use you, here's what you used to say. When you first got saved, if if you've given your life to Christ, you you thought this, you said um, that God can use me despite my past. Right? We, we've said, I've said that. I, I'm glad that God can use me despite my past. I made some decisions. I call them mistakes, but they were really planned out and on purpose at the time. And I feel bad. I've repented of them. Like, despite my past. But I wanted to change, I wanted to change just one word because your confidence is at stake. Just one word. And, and it begins because I don't understand how if they were crying in Israel or in Egypt, how all these Israelites were crying out to God in Egypt. Why would God come three days journey over to Moses who left that years ago? Why would God use Moses? Why wouldn't he just find another leader that's right here crying out and say, yeah, follow him? It must be because God wants to use you because of your past. The same way that he used Moses because of his past. It was probably because Moses is one of the few people who could actually get a meeting with Pharaoh. Come on, somebody. Like, How many of you know that if I went to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now and rang the front doorbell, Mr. Biden, please, I would be dismissed or taken down. Like one of the two, like, I'm not getting that meeting, okay? He's not going to answer that call. But Moses had a relationship with the Pharaoh 
So God's saying, hey, you're the one who can actually get a meeting with him. I need to use you because of your past. And get this, he had character along the way. Every step of the way, Moses has been protecting people. And now God is stepping in and saying, hey, I need you to go help my people. He protected the Hebrew being beaten by the Egyptian. He protected the Egyptian that was beating the other Hebrew. He protected the women that were being attacked by the whale. He's always been protecting. So now God's saying, I need you to go back and do another conflict. And Moses is saying, I'm just not, not willing. And I think it's because of his past. But I want you today to have confidence in your calling that God is calling you not despite your past, not in spite of your past, but because of your past. And it's because of that that will put you in rooms with people that I would never be in a room with no one else. And so that's part of your calling because there are people in your home and in your office space and wherever you find community that need to hear about the good news of God. And you're the only one that can be in that room. So we're going to go into this worship song here, and it's about a good plan that God has. And I just want you to, be, to begin by saying, God, you can use me. I'll go, you, you can use me. I'm standing up for the call. I'm coming to the call. God, you can use me to reach who you want to reach. And then I want you to worship in this song because God has a plan. That's the reason you're in this room. It's because somebody answered the call. And maybe you're here today and like, this is all brand new information. Somebody invited you here because they answered a call. So we all have this calling, this purpose of our lives. So please don't miss this moment. As the praise team begins to sing, and uh, Glenn, you can come get this thing. I'm done with it before we get into next Sunday. (laughs) But I wanted to pray with us and then let's worship together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for every person in this room. I pray, God, that we would have confidence in who you are and that you have called us because of our past, because of our passions that we've mislabeled as as anger and, and frustration, but it's really that we're passionate about the people around us and time and how it's spent. So, God, may we realign to answer that and honor you with our passion. But help each person because you have a good plan. And you have an amazing plan and a purpose for each of our lives. As we sing about it today, God, we give you glory. Amen.